the shooting range. In this episode, we return to the story of the glorious Corsair and remember its last flight. We guide you through the Air SB mode just in case you'd be interested. Hotline, the developers answer questions that you've left in the comments. But first, let's start with looking a little forward and testing one of the newest British ships. Today, we've got our hands on the FPB 1101 artillery boat, sitting at BR 2.0. This fine specimen is perfectly suitable for a total annihilation of enemy boats. Feast your eyes, folks. It has a whopping 114mm cannon as a main armament. 114mm! It's basically a destroyer-class weaponry on a tiny, tiny ship. True, it only fires HE shells, but you won't really need anything more than that. Besides, 100 shells on board is actually more than enough. The FPB-1101 also comes equipped with a 40mm Bofors AA gun, with a total ammunition load of 1,500 projectiles and a much more liberating arsenal of shell types. Add some depth charges to top that off, and you'll get a ravenous beast capable of devouring everything in its wake. Ballistics of the main cannon prevent you from engaging targets at large distances. Try to stay somewhere at between 1 and 2 kilometers from your prey. That may be too close for one's comfort, but on the other hand, your main caliber is so damn powerful that it's rare to see someone withstand more than two confirmed hits. Hell, most of the time even one hit will do the job. Use your bofors against long-range or agile enemy. It also, to no one's surprise, shreds aviation. Keep that in mind. Acceleration dynamics and maneuverability of this Brit is on a par with its armaments. At the weight of 64 tons, it accelerates up to 74 kph in realistic battles and up to almost 100 in arcade. Understandably, it doesn't have any armor, but it has a crew of 15 sailors, decent for an artillery boat. But of course, don't stroll under enemy fire for too long. Because of your pretty high profile, you'll become a Swiss cheese in no time at all. In battles, stick to your allies. Always try to one-shot your targets and don't forget about peculiar ballistics of the main cannon. It takes six seconds to reload, but given its firepower, that's perfectly excusable. Another advantage of yours is speed. Use it to swiftly strike your foes and immediately reposition. Plan your route, take a note of priority targets, and enjoy heaps of smoldering junk that once were your enemies sinking to the bottom of the sea. And now, let's find out how pirates are connected to football. In the very first episode of The Shooting Range, we talked about the creation of the Corsair the first fighter aircraft outfitted with an 18-cylinder radial engine. And now, as this beautiful line of fighters has been reinforced with a new model, it's time to dive into the details about why the Corsair became first and last machine of its kind on active duty. After the war was unleashed upon Europe and the USA joined the party, it became clear that the Corsairs were the best shore-based naval fighters, even if they had some eh, problems with fitting on carrier decks. Their actual issues weren't too problematic. The early Pratt & Whitney R2800 sometimes overheated, and the maneuverability of the Corsairs at low speeds was underwhelming. 
Plus, the British dreamed of swapping the high-caliber Brownings for 20mm cannons. The Chancevoort Construction Bureau, under a leadership of the Corsair's creator and a brilliant aviation engineer, Rex Beisel, was happy to oblige. Firstly, the Bureau developed a cannon modification of the plane, then, by commission from the Royal Navy, Beisel and company created a Corsair with slightly clipped wings that could fit onto British carriers. After that, at the F4U4 modification, it was time to revamp the engine propeller unit. Home to perfection in a mass serial production, the 18-cylinder Pratt & Whitney received a water methanol-based injection system and quadravane air propeller. That, my friends, brought this plane on a completely new level. Production of the Corsairs grew so massively that, by the beginning of 1944, it became the most produced naval fighter in the world. The Super Corsair, with its astonishing 28-cylinder engine, became the last Corsair modification of World War II. It was imagined as a low-altitude interceptor brought to life to counteract the Japanese OK cruise missiles, but it didn't get this serial production. The war ended. Not for long, though. The Korean War was next, and this conflict, once again, reminded everyone of the greatness that is the Corsair. It aged, but gracefully, like a fine wine. It was still an outstanding naval strike aircraft, so of course it received another modification. How, how couldn't it? The F4U-7, developed after the conflict, was created primarily for naval aviation of France and continually saw action in Indochina, Egypt and Algeria. Surely this was enough fighting for one old man, wasn't it? Surely it's time to fly off into the sunset, right? Nah, you're being naive. After the Korean War, two countries, Honduras and Salvador, bought some Corsairs as well. Both of them were nominally allies and satellites of the USA, but in fact, they weren't getting along too well. So naturally, in 1969, those two, very much like siblings, started an outright dumb and meaningless armed conflict. Later, it became known as the Football War. This titular football match was, of course, nothing more than an excuse or a final drop in a political dispute. The idiocy of this whole affair was amplified by the fact that both warring countries used identical Corsairs with dark blue American camo. But wait, there's more. Markings on the planes were nearly indistinguishable from each other. Radios of both factions used the same frequencies. Pilots of both factions spoke <laughs> Spanish. Without any actual fighting experience, they desperately chased each other, trying to understand who was an enemy and who was an ally. After a round or two of this exhilarating game of catch-up, pilots would usually just return to base. Funnily enough, the governments of both countries repeatedly boasted about complete and utter annihilation of enemy aviation in a glorious battle, baffling even the Pentagon eggheads who, well, saw a battle or two. Silliness aside, there were some actual casualties. For example, a Honduran pilot, Fernando Soto, took down a Salvadorian Mustang while flying a Corsair. And now, bear with us, please. Think about it. Fernando earned another couple of victories by taking down another Corsair, thereby making the Corsair the last piston-engine fighter in history that managed to take down another piston-engine fighter, thereby making the Corsair the last piston-engine fighter that was taken down by a piston-engine fighter. Phew. <laughs> easy, easy, breathe. Now that's a recursion if ever we've seen one. By the way, the Corsair continued its duty in Honduras until as late as 1981. Good for them, we guess? Okay, 
You weren't that keen on hearing about Air SB mode, but funnily enough, the viewers of the Russian version of the show were even a bit too interested in that. So let's crack it anyway. You might find it quite useful, you know. The SB mode in War Thunder is an ode to realism and a place for true hardcore souls. You're the one to pilot the machine, so the only view you get here is from a cockpit. Also, you and only you are in control of the aircraft. There's no help from the instructor, like in the other modes. On the other hand, as the only guiding hand here is yours, now you can really show off with all these cool aerobatic maneuvers. First things first. If you really want to play with comfort and high efficiency, get some special gear. A joystick, pedals, engine control levers and, yeah, VR glasses if you want the full experience. But you'll work these out on your own. As for this section, we'll focus on a more traditional approach with a mouse and keyboard. Go in the controls section of the settings and select full reel controls. Also, we recommend to choose the mouse joystick mode. It won't be easy, but as soon as you get on top of it, you'll best anyone in a dogfight. Then get to camera control and set the key for head movement. Use the numpad for example. These actions will allow you to look around inside the cockpit, including looking backwards behind your seat and forward above the control panel. And visibility is key in SB. You'll be using these buttons all the time. Now, let's get a bit further down and set the controls for trimming. This is basically your cruise control in SB. You'll find out that the aircraft behaves differently depending on your speed. For example, you'll want to set your elevator trimmers at about 5 to 15 percent while taking off. That is, if you want your plane to actually fly and not bite the dust like that one other guy. Then, after you get a couple of meters higher, you might find out that the plane is slightly banking because of your propeller constantly rotating in one direction. To normalize your course, Set the aileron trimmers to counter the movement of the propeller until you get to horizontal flight. And while climbing, you can, of course, constantly correct your course manually. Or you can set the rudder trimmers at about 20 to 25 percent. You'll find the optimal angle on your own. Also, remember that here you also have to use manual engine control that we've discussed previously. Now let's get to custom battles. Even before you turn your engine on, look at your plane carefully, study all its parts, move some trimmers and set them to take off position. Remember that the plane will get a bit bumpy even before you get off the ground, so don't forget to use the rudder. Control the aircraft with your mouse if needed. Set the trimmers in another position, or you might fall down right after you take off. Okay, it seems that you're actually flying. Congrats! The worst part is behind you, until the second you decide to land. And one more thing, don't overuse your rudder and elevators. Otherwise, you might stall, then fall onto another wing, and after that, it's moments before an uncontrollable spin dive. To avoid that, don't forget to check your wings to catch the flow separation moment and, yeah, listen to your machine. It sends you some really shaky signals before things get messy. As for the battles, don't rush into the center of the map from the start. Assess the situation, climb a bit, locate the enemy. It's substantially harder in SB since you're looking through the windows in the cockpit. Chances are you'll spend more than one day in custom battles just trying to take off, not to mention the flying and actual dogfights and maneuvers. If you want to become a true SB ace, 
you'll have to work very hard. And that's where all the fun is, isn't it? Get ready for the traditional last part of our show, Hotline, developers answering questions from the comments. The first question comes from a user called Swedish Style 97. Hi, is there something you can say about the new Tech 3 Nations that you're working on? Hi there. We actually can't for now. But you'll be hearing from us quite soon regarding the next update, so keep your eyes peeled. Then there's another message coming from Omar Selumon, T72. When? Hi there, mate. Can't tell you exactly when, but it will be in the game for sure. Asmitexo asks, Can we expect a Vietnam-based tank map? Let's say we aren't planning to stop making more maps anytime soon, tank ones included. So Vietnam is also a possibility. And the last very serious message is from Protovon Version. Can we see a question from you in the hotline, Bruce? That's called abuse of power and all that. You know, conflict of interest. I'll try to stick to your questions for now, but thank you. Well, that's it for today, but feel free to write your questions in the comments below. We do read them all, and you might see some of them answered in the next episode. If you like what we're doing, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you on The Shooting Range.